Thank you for joining our webinar on So You Think You Can Export, Exporting 101, Part 2. I see a lot of familiar names uh, from last week's Exporting 101, Part 1, so that's great. Um, but just in case you missed it, uh, my name is Evan Buey, and I'm an International Initiatives Officer here at Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, uh, specifically working on the export readiness and market intelligence files. So similar, similar to last week, um, I've got a couple of slides uh, to share before we jump into our feature presentation. Uh, these here are the programs and services my team offers. I'll let you read it on your own, um, as it looks like most everyone uh, listening in today also listened in last week. But if you require any further information, please feel free to reach out. Um, so instead, I thought I would actually take a moment to set the stage for today's topic and take a deeper dive into the market intelligence services we offer and look at some stats and market opportunities for Alberta agri-food exporters. So these are the top 10 countries Alberta exports our agri-food products to, uh, along with the percent change from 2018. As expected, the U.S. is number one, with some of the usual offenders following suit. Uh, a couple noteworthy reasons for the significant increase or decrease in exports for a few countries here. Uh, looking at China, so China's decline was largely due to a decrease in animal and crop imports, such as canola oil, canola seed, wheat, and rawhides and skins. Mex Mexico's decline was because of less imports of canola seed and wheat. Bangladesh's increase was a result of canola seed, uh, wheat, and dried peas. And South Korea's increase was a result of an increase in canola oil, wheat, processed potatoes, and beef. So breaking down that uh, previous slide even further, we've got the top products, Alberta exports, to the top four export markets. We've got the major players here as, as usual, beef, and the canola products making an appearance on each list. Um, I realize many of our listeners' products likely don't fall into these categories, but um, if I were to go one by one, we'd probably be here for weeks. So uh, I encourage you to please reach out to me uh, if you'd like this sort of information on your specific product. So these next slides here, I didn't prepare the next four myself. Uh, they were taken from an Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada presentation from a comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, CPTPP seminar that I helped organize back in 2018. And I just wanted to point out some additional market opportunities for agri-food products as a result of this agreement, uh, specifically since it is fairly new. So I picked uh, just three categories to, to spotlight here quickly. Um, the first one being honey. So the big winner for Canadians is the 0% tariff in Japan uh, by year eight. Uh, Vietnam and New Zealand are already at 0% tariff, which is great. Um, so if you watched our, pres our webinar last week, uh, Christian touched on rules of origin. But you'll see for, for natural honey, the honey must be from live bees within the CPTPP country. So this means uh, there's no blending uh, with foreign honey or any additives. Further examples of some winners under uh, CPTPP in the processed food and beverage category. Uh, biscuits, cookies, and crackers going in Japan going from 15% tariff to 0% by April 2023. Uh, rolled and flaked oats in Vietnam going from 20% to 0% by January 2021. And uh, sauces in Malaysia have already gone from 10% to 0%. Uh, lastly, I'll just highlight sugar and confectionery products. So 0% tariffs ac across the board um, here at, in this time. Um, Again, if you're interested in more information on the CPTPP agreement, be sure to check out Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's CPTPP for Agri-Food Exporters website, or uh, reach out to me and I can connect you with some more information as well. So my last slide here before I hand things over, again, uh, this was covered last week during part one. So this is more of a friendly reminder, uh, but I encourage you to sign up for program notifications uh, for when these grants 
uh, reopen as they are closed right now, um, but uh, they should reopen in the next fiscal year. Okay, so that's enough from me. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our presenter. Many of you know him by now, but we again will be joined by Christian Sivier uh, with Solimpex. So following a 30 year career uh, in international logistics in Europe and Canada, Christian started a Montreal based import export consultancy in 2010 called Solimpex, which is active in two areas consulting and coaching to help SMEs grow internationally and training in uh, logistics, customs and regulatory aspects of international trade, importing, exporting, free trade agreements, supply chain management and related issues. Christian lectures for CIFFA, the Canadian International Freight Forwarders Association in Toronto and FIATA, the World Federation of Freight Forwarders in Zurich. He also gives seminars and webinars for various trade organizations and provides personalized training for importers and exporters. Uh, so with that, I will now hand it over to you, Christian. All right, thank you very much, Evan, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to speak to, to the, the group again. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to uh, present the uh, second part of our Exporting 101 webinar. So thank you all for being with us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here again. And so today we'll talk more about uh, last week. If uh, those of you who were with us remember, we'll talk more more about um, uh, market issues. Today it's more uh, focusing on the nuts and bolts of exporting uh, a few of the technical aspects uh, that are important. So I have a lot of information for you. I'll try to maintain a good pace so that we have time at the end for questions. Uh, of course, so I don't need to introduce myself. Evan just did that, so thank you very much for that. So first topic we have on the agenda today on the presentation, we want to draw your attention to some of the very important aspects of exporting, and we won't go into details because uh, we, for, due to lack of time, of course, but uh, we just want to give you the, the you know an, an idea of the fundamentals also some um, some hints on of the of, on, on the uh, the most important aspects of uh, uh, that, that are a key to success in exporting it's not just uh, mar product development or market development it's also all the other um, practical considerations considerations sorry so the first one is think about yes yeah, the legal impact the legal impli legal implications of, of exporting going to different markets, going to overseas markets where the rules, regulations, laws are different. And so a key element really is to sit down with a legal expert, sit down with a lawyer to look at your contractual clauses and to make sure that you're as protected as possible or as protected as, as can be. And so the, the some of the considerations are which law is going to apply to the contract when I start selling, when I start selling, uh, shipping my goods overseas. And so the, the, the applicable law will be a first consideration. The second consideration is, is where do we settle disputes? Uh, that's an important aspect because it's fine to say we want Alberta law to, to apply, we want Canadian law to apply, but how do we actually enforce it, implement it. If we go to, if we have to go to court in Bangladesh or in Burkina Faso, uh, is a judge there going to um, be able to apply Alberta or Canadian law? So that's the, some of the fundamental questions we have to ask ourselves in that respect. And the second aspect is, if we have a dispute, do, are we going to go to court? Are we going to go in to see a judge? or are we going to follow an arbitration process? And so many companies do this nowadays. Arbitration is, is a good, is an excellent tool. And it usually enables companies to settle differences faster. And uh, so it's something to think about uh, at the very beginning. And then you incorporate these clauses in your contracts or in your offers or in your quotes. Uh, when, when you when you do business and so international laws are, are broad or wide uh, arbitration um, is a different um, way of settling disputes and there are international rules for arbitration you see so it's also quite uh, quite um, um, well uh, organized so 
um, that's one of the considerations to um, to look at. One of the things to look at, uh, as far as what is the um, uh, what is helping us, uh, which tool can be helpful in the context of international trade laws. Uh, it's something called the Vienna Convention, which most developed countries have signed. So if you, as long as you do business with a country that has signed the Vienna Convention, it is quite helpful from a legal standpoint because there are minimum parameters that will be um, respected and applied in all these countries. So some of the, uh, some of the components of the Vienna Convention are to define the responsibilities of the seller. And so uh, here, the responsibility of the seller is going to be to deliver the merchandise according to the INCO term that has been agreed upon between the parties, as well as transfer the ownership of the goods to the buyer and hand over all the relevant documentation that comes with it. Now, why do I talk about that? Is because, in fact, our, we'll touch on ownership and we'll touch on INCO terms in our, in our next slide. So it's a way for me to introduce them. And then the responsibilities of the seller are naturally are to pay for the goods, right? They've ordered them, so you've sent them, you've delivered them, so they have to pay for them. And uh, the other um, obligation uh, is to accept to take delivery, to accept to take them. So that is part of the responsibilities of the buyer. Uh, and, and, and a bit tricky is transfer of ownership. So we say the, uh, one of the main responsibilities of the seller, in addition, of course, to supplying the merchandise in, in quantity and quality that has been agreed. Um, but so the other responsibility we remember on the previous slide is to transfer the ownership. Now, the transfer of ownership actually is not covered, is not addressed by the Vienna Convention. And Transfer of ownership is something that's governed by the law of each country that you deal with. So that's the reason why it's very important to have a, a proper clause in your contracts, in your sales contracts, in your quotations, that you will retain the ownership until you got paid. And uh, why is that important is because in some countries, uh, depending on the applicable law, the ownership is um, is in the buyer is entitled to the ownership of the goods as soon as he confirms the order, whether or not he has paid for them, whether the goods have been delivered or not. Um, he is the legal owner of the goods, so that is a a, a kind of unexpected clause that you know it may be unexpected to some of you, but it is a fact. It comes from the the French civil code, and the civil code has had is not just applied in France and, 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 and other countries or, and in Quebec, it's also applied in many other countries or some principles coming from the civil code are applied in many countries, including in Canada, including for example, in the UK. And so always be uh, mindful of that. Protect yourself by saying right from the beginning, I retain ownership until I'm paid in full. And so just to give you an idea of which countries um, have this kind of clause in their, in their legal um, system or in their laws, um, where the ownership is, um, uh, where the buyer is the legal owner of the goods as soon as he confirms the order. So you find these kinds of, um, uh, of legal um, principle in Canada, in most provinces, even in, in, um, in Ontario. I haven't checked the uh, in Alberta, but I think it might be the case also in countries like Belgium, France, even the UK. The UK applies common law. It does not apply civil law, but it has still has this principle from the civil code about transfer of ownership. Now, luckily, many countries um, are not like this. Many countries will get, will protect the seller and will say the law of these countries will say as long as the seller didn't get paid. He's the owner of the goods. So that's the case in Germany, in Spain, and in the United States, which is great for us because, as you know, the U.S. is our, is our biggest, our first, uh, by far, our first export market. About three quarters of our exports go to the U.S. So the good news is when we go to the U.S., we are protected from that point of view. As, as long as we didn't get paid, we retain a legal ownership of the goods. And so it's when we go to more exotic countries that we should be careful about that. We should be mindful of that. So that's as far as legal 
as far as transfer of ownerships. The next uh, point, uh, which is also a legal um, point, but uh, is broader than that actually, is inco terms. So when you start exporting, when you start doing business internationally, it's very important that you become familiar with this, this little thing here, this little big thing that's called inco terms. Inco terms are internationally accepted, internationally recognized rules that say, uh, that split, uh, that divides the responsibility between the seller and the buyer when it comes to delivering merchandise. So based on the, on the inco term, it's, is, or the inco term is what's going to tell us who arranges what, who pays for what when it comes to delivering the merchandise. Uh, so delivery from where to where, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what the inco terms define. There's um, another aspect of inco terms that is not always well known is that it also they also define the transfer of risks between the seller and the buyer. I'll touch on that in a moment. So these inco terms are three letter abbreviations. There's 11 of them. They look like the ones I've seen, I've shown here on the slide, EXW for X works, FOB for free on board, et cetera. Um, they are updated every 10 years. The last version that uh, is in effect uh, was updated uh, or had been put in effect on January 1st this year. So today we deal or we use the 2020 version of the Ingo terms. And so transfer of, of costs, uh, who pays for what, who arranges what, that's easy to visualize. Transfer of the risks. For some of you, it may not be uh, that uh, clear what it means. So the transfer of the risks uh, is, what, what it means is this. If the goods disappear, if your container falls in the water, or if your uh, truck trailer load is stolen, or if your pallet uh, never arrives, was it, is it your loss as the seller, or is it the buyer's loss? That's what the inco terms define. Um, and that's a very important element of international trade. There's 11 inco terms. Of course, we won't go into too many details. I just want to give you a glimpse of them and so that you know, uh, you have a better idea of what it is. And I strongly recommend that you really inform yourself on that topic. Um, I give trainings on inco terms and you'd be surprised um, at each training that I give there's experienced people who, in fact, learn something because, you know, even if you're very experienced and you've done business for, for many years, you don't necessarily always know all the intricacies of all these terms. And so it's, very, um, it's a very important topic to, uh, to be familiar, as familiar as possible um, uh, to be. And uh, also, the other reason why it's important to be familiar with inco terms from a seller's point of view is that sometimes you'll deal with buyers who are not that familiar with them. So the more you know, the more knowledge you have, the better it is for you. Four maritime inco terms, seven multimodal, which we use for all transactions, for all, all modes of delivery. And where do the inco terms come in? Where do we use them? Well right from the beginning, as soon as you give a quote to a customer, as, do, as soon as you issue a, um, a, a price list, for example, uh, then, uh, or let's say you go to a trade show, you're going to have a price list that you're going to hand out to uh, customers, or customers contact you and they ask you for a quote, they ask you for a price, for a rate. Well, you should immediately attach an inco term to that, that will then um, highlight and, and demonstrate precisely what is included in your price and what is not included. What are your responsibilities? What are the buyer's responsibility? So from the beginning of a transaction, show an inco term next to your price after you've decided which one you want to use, of course, and after having included the cost components of the, of the inco term that you've selected. And then it should follow uh, when the customer confirms the order, sends you a PO, then the inco term should be shown on it same when you issue in your invoice, you should always show the inco term on it. And I, I wanted to, to, I use this uh, sample commercial invoice, which I found on the web. And so I enjoy using it because it's, uh, it's a website that gives examples of commercial documentation. And that commercial invoice is totally incomplete because it does not have an inco term. Your commercial invoice, when you ship goods, should look like this to a certain extent particularly the circled part. This is, this is where you have an inco term. So you see the letters CIP stands for cost insurance to the place. And 
it spells precisely what is included in the price, what is paid, what, what part of the costs are paid by the seller, what part of the costs are paid by the buyer, and also who has the risks uh, if something happens to the merchandise on the way. So that's all for anchor terms, but uh, again, it's an important topic. Now let's touch on the next one, terms of payment. Of course, if you're selling online, usually you'd be, you'd be paid by a credit card. So that doesn't, um, need, doesn't need further research. However, if you're de dealing um, B2B and uh, your client um, may be asking you to uh, give, him, give, him, give him or her terms, you know, uh, give her or, or him open accounts, open terms. So then that would be dangerous for you. Uh, you would like to be paid in advance when you deal with an overseas customers before you ship the goods. But then many overseas customers will say, no, I don't want to take a chance. I'm not going to pay you in advance. I don't know you. I don't know if you will supply the goods to me uh, as requested. So payment, the two extremes are to get paid in advance, which is not always possible, and to give credit to the overseas buyer, which is dangerous. So one solution to that is something called letters of credit or documentary credits, where uh, which act where, where a bank asks uh, is an in between um, between the seller and the buyer and guarantees the payment to the seller as well as guarantees the shipment to the buyer. So it's an important tool for international trade. There are international rules that are um, issued by the International Chamber of Commerce and that govern the, any letters of credit anywhere in the world, any bank you deal with, so long as the letter of credit refers the, to the UCP 600, you're uh, protected. Uh, how does it work? It's, it works the, in a way, and it works this way, is that you send your shipping documents and all your original documents to the bank, and then the bank gets the payment from the buyer and then forwards the documents to the buyer. And then you, as the seller, you're guaranteed to get paid right from the beginning, so long as you present the proper documents to the bank. And so there's international rules, which means it doesn't matter which bank you deal with or which country you deal with. It's also a very, a very safe um, payment instrument because it's an irrevocable instrument, which means that the buyer once the letter of credit has been issued in your favor and you've received it via the bank, then the buyer can't change his mind and say, okay, I'm canceling the order. Uh, I found the same product cheaper elsewhere, so I'm not buying from you anymore. So you see a letter of credit is, is, very, is very safe um, from, from a seller's point of view and also from a buyer's point of view. Uh, the challenges with a letter of credit is that you have to present the documentation exactly as per the request or as per the requirements of the credit. So it's a highly uh, technical um, tool and you really have to pay a lot of attention to details. Now, if that is not possible, because some buyers will say, well, why should I um, issue a lot of credit? Um, I don't, um, I, it's going to cost me money and so on and so forth. Sometimes buyers will offer to uh, issue a standby letter of credit. So uh, I don't want to spend time on this because it's, it's too technical. I just want to make you aware of the term so that you know it exists. And in fact, it's even better than a, than a letter of credit. So uh, if, uh, if uh, an international client um, to whom you ask uh, payments in advance and who says, well, no, I don't uh, make payments in advance, but I can issue you a standby letter of credit, uh, Take it seriously, don't disregard it. A standby letter of credit is an excellent instrument and it's also an excellent um, uh, tool for, uh, for it, it and which demonstrates that the buyer is serious. And now, if that is not possible, if you can't get paid in advance, if the um, buyer does not want to issue a letter of credit or does not offer you, does not offer to, to issue a standby credit, Sorry for the typo here, I just realized. So a tool that's very convenient and that's used a lot by Canadian exporters and particularly small and medium sized enterprises is that it's easy to purchase credit insurance to insure your receivables in cases where you have to give open terms to the customer. You've tried to get paid, the customer doesn't want to, you ask for a letter of credit, he doesn't want to bother because it costs money. And uh, 
Uh, and so you're kind of stuck um, with the prospect of losing the order if you insist on payment in advance or a letter of credit. So you can sometimes um, give credit to, to um, potential customers after doing, of course, a proper search as to, you know, what is that company? Are they, are they, have they been in business for a while, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have this great tool that protects you in case the customer doesn't pay you. So credit insurance is, a, is provided in Canada by EDC, um, which uh, offers, you know, great services to exporters, um, including financing, including market information. So credit insurance actually is their main line of business. So they'll protect you in case the buyer doesn't pay you. It's very easy to arrange that. You can go online and as long as you have a credit card, you can get coverage kind of instantly based on the country, the amount and the credit terms of the buyer. If, and if for some reason EDC can't cover you because maybe they're overexposed to certain countries so they don't want to take additional exposure, then there are private companies that offer similar services. The three biggest ones in the world are Cofas, uh, Hero Hermes, and Airtradius. They're uh, French, Dutch, and German, respectively. And they have offices in Canada, or they have agents in Canada, so uh, they could be um, a good resource also um, if for some reason EDC can't cover you, can't provide proper coverage. Um, so one of the considerations is uh, once you've decided where you're going to um, sell your goods, once you've done a lot of market research and you've identified countries where there's big potential, then you have to, of course, look at the risk element. And there are many tools available. Um, this one here is published by Hero Hermes. And uh, there's other companies that publish this type of information on a regular basis as to uh, the relative risk um, of, uh, of um, countries around the world. So that's a nice tool. It's a good tool to, to, um, to have at our disposal to look into. I mean, another tool that's interesting, you don't want to get tangled up into a um, corruption issue, uh, especially because there's more and more laws now that, uh, that try to prevent that. Um, we have laws in Canada about that, but there's also a, a pretty strong law in the U.S. called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which the U.S. can uh, initiate sometimes, and uh, they like to call to to apply its extraterritoriality. Uh, in other words, they can go after you even if the business transaction that you conducted has nothing to do with the U.S. So something to be aware of when you. Uh, overseas it's it unfortunately happens in some cases so we should stay away with that as much as possible away from that as much as possible another topic that you might run come into of course is exchange rate fluctuations i like this graphic it's a pretty it's relatively old it's a few years old but i really like using it because this is uh, this is the um, illustration of the fall in the british pounds after the brexit referendum in 2016 where nobody expected that uh, the yes sign would win. Everybody was expected, expecting that the no sign would win. And then everybody was so surprised about that, that the yes sign uh, won by about 51% or so, 51.9, that it had quite an impact on the pound sterling. The pound sterling, in fact, lost 10% of its value in 10, overnight in 24 hours. So uh, we have to be mindful of that. So one way to protect ourselves against exchange rate fluctuations is to, especially if you're going to have expenses in U.S. funds, for example, is to open a U.S. dollar account. And, uh, you know, because a lot of overseas clients will ask you to quote them and build them in U.S. dollars. So minimizing the exchange rate fluctuations factor and risk uh, would, be, uh, would be achieved that way by opening a U.S. dollar account in Canada. And, you know, if you do a lot of business in, with the European Union, for example, you could also open a euro-denominated account, bank account in Canada. Most Canadian banks will uh, give you that facility to have a euro account, just like uh, you can get a, a U.S. dollar account easily. Next on our list of things to do to be aware of when we want to export intellectual property. Remember, think about protecting your IP. Your IP is, your, is not necessarily just your patent or your design, but also things as simple as your name 
or your brand or the image that you use. So um, when we want to export in the US and we want to protect our IP, we can file with the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office. In the European Union, there is a um, one office that's uh, called the European Union IP Office that uh, where you can file in one shot and be protected in 27 countries, the 27 countries of the EU. And there's also new facilities offered by the Canadian Intellectual, Intellectual Property Office to give you to initiate a kind of a worldwide IP protection. Um, that is something new that just uh, was just uh, put in place recently after CADA signed uh, the Nice Agreement on that topic. Um, and so why is that important? Well, look at this. Uh, you may or may not have heard of that, but a few years ago, the St. Hubert chain of restaurants, which is headquartered in Quebec, um, has many restaurants and uh, uh, all across Quebec and Ontario. Uh, I don't think that we find them in Alberta. But uh, one day they discovered that somebody in China had copied their brand and was had opened St. Hubert restaurants in China. You know, So these things happen every now and then and are reported by the press. So you don't want to have your brand, your logo, your image um, stolen and used by somebody else. Another, another illustration of how IP, uh, trademarks are important. If you, uh, you might have heard of this, uh, this couple, uh, Harry and Megan, and their uh, travel from the UK to Canada first and then to the US. Well, one of the things they did is to um, file and try to get a trademark protection, a global trademark protection for their Sussex Royal brand. So they could, so they could sell, you know, um, mugs and, uh, and um, uh, um, whatever um, material they wanted to sell with their brand on them. On them. So uh, that's to illustrate the importance of protecting your trademark. I see even those people do it. So I think uh, that's an incentive for you to do it also, for us to do it also. So now we'll look at the um, more about, we'll look more at logistics issues, uh, risk management, and also a little bit on the documentation process, just to give you a feeling for what you need to do. Um, you know, give you an idea of the main components of uh, uh, compliance. And, and uh, when we start exporting, there are requirements for filing export declarations as requirements about export permits. So we'll touch on all these things without going into details because it would be far, it would take far too long, but to give you hints and pointers um, on these different things. So first, the first one talking about risk management, cargo insurance. So cargo insurance, why do we take cargo insurance when we sell goods and we ship them internationally is because we want to be compensated if something happens, if they're stolen, if they're damaged during the transit. And so it doesn't matter where we ship our goods to or what mode of transportation or what shipping company we use because there are international rules international clauses, and so they're called the Institute Cargo Insurance Clauses, Institute Cargo Clauses A, B, or C. So I don't want to bore you with all these details, but I just want to make you aware that there's international clauses that, can, that, that, are, that govern that industry. And so it doesn't matter where you're going to, um, which company you use, they should normally apply these um, standard rules, uh, standard clauses. So it's, 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 it's good to know uh, when you get prices also from different companies, then they should be clearly identifying the um, ICC clauses. So it's, uh, it's helpful this way to be able to compare apples with apples. Um, and so these rules are defined, used um, globally, and have very specific meaning, very specific coverages, exclusions, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that these things happen sometimes. I use that picture because I happened to be in Vancouver that week. I was presenting at a conference, at Cargo Canada Logistics Conference, and it was um, exactly that week that the um, that crane fell on the, on the on the Evergreen container ship, and that part of the port was closed for a week. So. Um, that is something that I, I, I remember vividly. Uh, things happen to aircrafts also once in a while, unfortunately. Um, 
So what I'm getting at here is, uh, yes, things can happen sometimes, um, no matter how much, how careful we are, how many precautions we take. But the important thing here and the message I want to deliver here is that carriers, whether they're ocean carriers, trucking companies, uh, railways, airlines, they have contractual limits of liability that you may not be aware of. And why you wouldn't be aware of them sometimes is that they're not obvious to find. They're on the fine print, you know, somewhere at the bottom or on the back of a document, of a shipping document. So this is an essential slide here for you uh, that I want, I want to draw your attention to. If you ship goods by truck in Canada, it uh, doesn't matter which province you go to, even though trucking is a provincial uh, jurisdiction, a provincial activity, a provincially regulated, there is an, a uniform rule across Canada. If a trucking company loses your shipment uh, or if your shipment gets damaged, the maximum they'll reimburse you is $4.41 per kilo. So be aware of that. If you go to the US, it's a little different because it's not uniform. Sometimes it can be as low as 60 cents a pound, which is one of the reasons why if you get, uh, you know, if you if you want to get a shipment delivered to the U.S., uh, sometimes you'll get a quote from a Canadian trucker and one from a U.S. trucker. Be careful. The U.S. trucker will may be a bit cheaper, but one of the reasons for that is that he has a much lower liability uh, limit. So something to be aware of. If you're shipping goods by air internationally, um, the usual um, liability limit is between thirty and forty dollars per kilo. It depends on the applicable convention and on the nationality of the airline. Uh, and then if you ship goods by ocean car by ocean freight, ocean cargo, then uh, there's also a variation. The liability limit depends on the applicable convention, which depends on the country uh, where the uh, uh, loss occurred. In Canada, for example, it would be $900 US per container. Whereas in the US, it would be $500 per container. So just to give you a range. And freight forwarders, $3 a kilo. Courier companies, it depends on the courier company. They don't have a uniform rule. UPS will have a limit per box. FedEx will have a limit per pound, et cetera, et cetera. So the main thing is, if you send goods by courier company, by truck, by ocean, by air, if something happens to the goods, you'll never get your money back from the carrier because carriers have limits of liability and they're here on the slide. So that's the main reason why we should always think about taking cargo insurance to be full, fully covered if something happens, depending also, of course, on the what the agreement is with the customer and depending on the INCO term. So that's what I wanted to share with you on insurance, on uh, part of risk management. Last slide on that. Uh, I, I extracted statistics from the London insurance market, the biggest one in the world for cargo insurance. And these are the main ca causes of claims uh, that, that based on the claims that they receive on, on, a, on a yearly basis. And so it's no surprise that yes, accidents, handing equipment, collisions, the forklift at the port or at the airport or in the distribution center, theft, of course, that makes sense. Oh, that's you know that's uh, that's logical. I want to draw your attention to the last one: inadequate packaging. Ten percent of claims uh, arise or happen because of inadequate packaging. So that's the message I want to pass on to you um, on this topic. Make sure that your packaging is adequate. Don't just think of the packaging for uh, of the ideal packaging from the sales point of view. You know, to develop a, a, the most beautiful product and sell it in the most attractive of packaging so that it sells well. Remember to think about the packaging to the outer packaging to protect your goods while they are being shipped to your clients, while they are on the truck or on the, on the aircraft or, or on the boat. And so that's an important element. 10% of claims happen because of inadequate packaging. That's, I think that's a huge proportion. And the other reason I want to talk to you about this is, guess what happens to a claim if, uh, if the insurance company determines that it was caused by improper packaging, inadequate packaging? They won't pay you. It actually cancels the coverage because the insurance will say, 
that you indirectly cause the claim by not protecting your cargo well enough, by not protecting, by, by shipping cargo that was not adequately protected and packaged for the voyage. Um, and so that's also why I want to point that out to you and um, point, bring your attention to that important uh, element of uh, successful exporting. Now we'll touch briefly on the documentation to draw your attention to the main elements that are required when we export overseas, uh, when we export to the US. The main component is the commercial invoice. That's the first one. Why is it important is because, well, it's an evidence of your contract between you know, yourself and the buyer. It's also the instrument by which you'll get paid. And it's also the document that will go to customs and that will support the customs declaration. So that's the most important document in the transaction. A packing list is also always, always recommended unless the details are, are, can be incorporated in the invoice. A certificate of origin will be issued in some cases. I'll touch on that in a moment. The insurance certificate, <coughs> excuse me, depends of course on who is arranging the insurance. Is it you, the seller, or is it the buyer? <coughs> excuse me. And this depends on the income term. Now, depending on the product, or in the country, there could be other documentary requirements. Usually your customer will tell you about this. <clears throat> now I want to touch briefly on these uh, technical terms. Pro forma invoice or commercial invoice, sometimes it's not clear to companies which they have to issue. Generally speaking, when you, have, when you sell goods overseas and you expect a payment, you will issue a commercial invoice. A pro forma invoice is something you will issue um, if you don't get paid, if there's no payment involved. It's like, um, for example, if you ship, if you're going to a trade show and you're, um, or you're sending uh, samples over to uh, potential clients, or you're exhibiting your products at an exhibition, then you would need to produce a document that customers will uh, that will tell customers what is in the shipment. Who is, this, who is the shipper, who is the consignee, what are the goods, what, are the, what is the value. So that's when you would issue a pro forma invoice. Uh, so that's the difference between the two. They would contain the same information, basically. So it's just to um, draw your attention to the language and, and what, what these terms mean. Uh, certificates of origin will be issued by, by you, the seller, the exporter, either if you are sending, selling, sending goods to um, countries with which we have a free trade agreement, for example, on the US, in Mexico, European Union. Evan was talking about trans the Trans-Pacific Partnership earlier, so it would be Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, Vietnam. So when you sell to those countries, you have to produce a specific certificate of origin. Now, some other countries with which we don't have a free trade agreement also require certificates of origin. And uh, it's, uh, it's something to inquire uh, when you get into that. Um, there's many countries in the world that require that kind of um, document. And then it's not the same as a free trade agreement certificate of origin. It's, it's a more generic form, but uh, it's the same principle you, the seller, has to produce a document that confirms the origin of the product and it's used for customs clearance at destination. Now, in Canada, I want to make you aware of the fact that in Canada, we have laws that require us to obtain export permits when we sell and we ship goods to countries that are either on the area control list or goods that are on the export control list so the area control list is very short. It's, it only contains one country, it's North Korea. We used to have Myanmar there and Belarus, but they were removed a couple of years ago. And on the export control list, we have, um, um, basically we have seven chapters uh, on that list. And there um, you'll find military goods, uh, nuclear goods, so that's obvious that uh, if you wanted to export any of these products, then it would make sense that you would require an export permit, right? You would, you would expect that. However, there's some categories of goods that are 
where you wouldn't necessarily expect to have to obtain an export permit, but in fact you do. So the main the categories that I, that is um, sometimes not uh, well known is that if you if we export dual use goods and we need an export permit in many cases, dual use goods refer to to goods that have been produced for civilian use, but they could also be used with a they could also have a military application. So that could be you know could cover communication equipment for example. So we have to be aware of that and mindful of that. And so the key thing here is when when we export. It's our responsibility to make sure that we don't fall in any of these categories. And if we do, then it's our responsibility to apply for an export permit to Global Affairs uh, Canada. It's not that uh, that section, that part of uh, requirement is not handled by uh, the Canada Border Services Agency. It's export as uh, Global Affairs that handles that. And this is who, who to whom we uh, we would apply for export permits. We also have economic sanctions, partial economic sanctions against some countries. Sometimes it's, uh, they're pretty broad, for example, with North Korea, but sometimes they're narrow and specific. They're specific to certain entities or to certain people uh, or to certain companies. Uh, for example, in Venezuela, there's a list of companies and of people that we, um, we're not expected to be selling to. And if we want to, then we would have to apply for an export permit. So again, these are of course very specific and very, you know, uh, um, I don't expect you to run into customers from South Sudan every day or every week, but nevertheless, it's important to know that these requirements, these restrictions exist. What we should always know, what we should also know is that there are um, US sanctions. Um, and so, why should we uh, be a, why should we be mindful of U.S. sanctions? Well, it's because the U.S. has had this tendency to consider that their laws have an extraterritorial application. So they they really want to enforce the extraterritoriality of their laws when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to um, uh, these um, restrictions. Uh, here I have an example from Honda America. Honda Canada that had leased vehicles to the Cuban embassy in Ottawa. And uh, the because Honda Canada was not a direct subsidiary of Honda Japan, it was a subsidiary of Honda America in the States. And then Honda America is a subsidiary of Honda Japan, of course. But because the Canadian entity was linked to the US Honda Corporation, uh, US, uh, the um, US Honda Corporation got nabbed by uh, the U.S. for allowing one of its subsidiary to deal with Cuba. And so from a Canadian perspective, there's nothing wrong with dealing with Cuba because we all go there on vacation once in a while and, um, and or we, we used to, and hopefully we'll be able to go again. But also business-wise, there's no Canadian sanctions against Cuba whatsoever. So we, we, we can export what we want to Cuba, but uh, we cannot export anything that is... Uh, Closely, remote, uh, closely related or closely or remotely related to the US because the US has sanctions against Cuba. So therefore, we cannot export US goods from Canada to Cuba. Or we cannot export goods that have been made with US technology to Cuba. That would be going against US sanctions. Just like we can't carry, uh, you've seen, you've heard on the news, um, Greek tankers carrying Iranian oil to Venezuela. So. We can't do that because that goes against U.S. sanctions and the U.S. Uh, wants to apply its laws across the globe. And uh, it's gotten a little bit worse since uh, 2016. So we don't know what uh, the future holds on that, which way it's going to go. But I guess we'll see that uh, early November. Now, going back to the nuts and bolts, we want to export, we master the legal requirements and the um, uh, inquiry terms and the risk management. What do we need to do in terms of Canadian documentation? Well, we have to file export declarations for any, any shipment, any goods worth more than $2,000. And we have an exemption with the US. So when we export to the US, we don't have to file an export declaration. If we export anywhere else, we have to file an export declaration electronically to the Canada Border Services Agency 
And the time frame we have to follow and we have to be aware of is that we have to file the declaration uh, at least two days before the vessel departs in the case of an ocean shipment and at least two hours before the flight leaves in the case of an air shipment. So if we don't do it, then we would um, most likely receive a penalty from CBSA. We would get fines from uh, CBSA for not having filed our declarations in time. So this is called a B13, by the way, just for your information um, and for reference. So well, that's one of the things that we have to be aware of, uh, particularly if we do um, a, a common mistake by Canadian for, for, that Canadian exporters run into sometimes is when we start, our first export market is the US. And so sometimes we're content with exporting to the US. So it's simple as far as requirements, as far as Canadian customs requirement, because we don't file any export declaration. But then when we start exporting overseas, then we have to mi be mindful of the fact that then we do need to produce export declarations a certain way within a certain time frame. Um, that's part of the learning curve of going from you know, diversifying our exports. Um, and the first step to do that, to file for, uh, to file our export declaration is to activate our business number for exports. That's very easy. Um, you do that with uh, just a phone call at the, with the Canada Revenue Agency. And then they just, they take your business number and they associate it with an import export account. And then when you start shipping your goods overseas, then you, when you produce a B13, then you show that number um, on your, uh, you or your freight forwarder will show that number on the export declaration. Now, who is going to help you with uh, dealing with those logistics issues? We talked about air shipments, ocean shipments, truck shipments. It's not something when we begin, when we are new to exporting, it's not necessarily something we can do ourselves because there's so many people, so many carriers, so many possibilities. And there's so much to learn, so much to know when we begin that one of the ways to, one of the partners that can help us is the international freight forwarders. So international freight forwarders are key to success really for, for new exporters because they'll help us navigate through the requirements. They'll help, help us get an efficient shipping um, service at, at a reasonable cost uh, and so on. And so, uh, when we look for freight forwarders in Canada, one good source of information is CIFA, the Canadian International Freight Forwarders Association. If you go on their website, you'll have a list of companies of Canadian freight forwarders that are so, that are members of CIFA, and uh, you can just find them um, by province, by city. So that is a very good source of uh, information. There's also actually there's all kinds of other useful information on this. If our website, ticks and customs issues. The carriers will be, yes, whether they're land carriers, ocean carriers, or air carriers, sometimes will be hard to reach. And so it's much better, especially when we're small, when we begin, it's much better to go through a freight forwarder. Uh, there's international couriers, of course, you know, the FedEx and UPSs of this world for smaller shipments for, for e commerce. Um, and then the other category of people who can be helpful is customs brokers. So there's likewise, as for international freight forwarders, there's a Canadian Association of Customs Brokers where you can look for members and information. And it doesn't matter which mode of transportation you use or which type of partner you use, be mindful of their terms and conditions so that you know um, what you're dealing with. Uh, so very briefly, I have a few slides here by mode of transportation. So if you're shipping goods by truck, to mainly to the US, I guess, and to Mexico, uh, I just want to make you a little bit familiar with some of the language that we use, that, that, that trucking companies use. So if you send a whole van, a whole trailer load, it's called an FTL in, in the um, trucking industry. And you'll pay so much per the voyage, per so much for the trip from your door to your, to your customer's door. Um, if you're shipping less than a full load, then it's called an LTL. It's called a, a less than trailer load. And there you'll pay a price per hundred pounds. We have this funny um, system of assessing truck rates by the still by the pounds, even though we are imperial. We're, we're not imperial, we're, we're metric. And that's because the US uh, still use the, the imperial system. So we sort of kept the tradition in Canada, even though for other modes of transportation, we use the metric system. 
There's a weight volume formula to be mindful of. Sometimes you'll pay on the volume weight. If you send goods by container load, by con container shipment, by boat, then there's different sizes of containers. And if you send a 20 foot container or a 40 foot container, it doesn't matter if it's half full or completely full, it will be a price per container for the voyage. If you have less than a full load, then you'll be shipping goods in pallets or in crates or boxes. Then that's called an LCL, or less than container load. And there the pricing is by the weight or the volume. It's per ton or cubic meter, whichever is the higher. So you have to be a little bit mindful of the volume of your package. Uh, when you go by air, there's two factors to consider. One is that the weight volume factor is quite favorable because the weight volume factor is, is one to six. So your goods can be quite bulky. You'll still only pay on the weight. So that's one thing to know about. The other thing is that when you ship goods by air, the price, prices are very different, whether you ship 50 kilos or 100 kilos or, or 500 kilos. So it's something to be aware of. By air, it's, if you can do it in, a, in any way, um, it's, it's, it's good, it's worthwhile to consolidate shipments to have uh, bigger shipments because the price is very different. For example, if you pay, if you, pay you know, uh, $5 a kilo on, 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 a, on, a, on a 50 kilo shipment to London or to Tokyo, maybe you'll pay $3 on a 500 kilo shipment and maybe you'll pay $2 on a 1,000 kilo shipment. So the rates really come down uh, as you, uh, the bigger the shipment, the, the, the lower the rate. It does not necessarily, necessarily apply the same way in ocean shipments. So it's a feature of air. Courier companies all have their pricing structure, the weight volume formula. There's no uniform rule. They, as we said a moment ago, they also have, um, each have their limits of liability. Some have it by, by, by package, some have it by pound or kilo. So they each have their rules and regulations and, and uh, their tariff and their way to apply that tariff. So we have to be a bit careful when we deal with them, when we compare prices from different curry companies compare the um, details, weight volume formula, uh, limits of liability, etc. Now, wood packaging material is something um, quite important, again, when we export overseas. So we have to know that there is rules, international rules, when it comes to the wood packaging materials that we're going to use to protect our shipment doing the transportation. So then they apply on pall to pallets, to crates, to any wood, any, any solid wood we use for packaging to protect our shipment based on the mode of transportation. And these rules are called the ISPM 15 rules. Um, they are international uh, uh, rules whereby you have to use, you must use treated wood when you export overseas. And that wood has to be treated, has to have been treated um, uh, following certain specific uh, international rules and requirements. It's either heat treated or fumigated and you have to have your packaging then that has, a, has to have the, uh, the mark, the um, applicable internationally recognizable mark as is highlighted here on the slide, CA01385. It identifies the country, it identifies the identification name of the company that supplied the wood and it identifies the process, which here is heat treatment, abbreviated HT. Now, some Canadian exporters are not aware of this, and I'll tell you why in a moment, is because we have an exemption with the US. So what this means is that if you, when you start exporting to the US, and if you export only to the US, you don't need to use treated wood as long as you use Canadian or American wood. If you recycle, wood or pallets that have that you have received overseas and it's a different story so uh, exemption with the us only for canadian and american wood and uh, any other any other place in the world including mexico for example you have to use treated wood otherwise either your shipment will get stuck when it, when it uh, gets into the country of destination or it will cost you a lot of money to um, perhaps having treat, have it treated locally and for your information, Canada has this same requirements on inbound uh, shipments. 
if you're a, a manufacturer, a distributor, an importer of uh, products uh, that you bring from overseas, then you have to tell your international suppliers that they have to use treated wood because Canada does not allow the uh, entry of uh, non-treated wood packaging material in the country. So it works in both directions for um, Canada and for the US. But when it comes to Canada-US trade, there we have a mutual exemption. So you don't need to use treated wood when you export to the US. And likewise, if you were buying products in the US, your US supplier does not have to use treated wood as long as he uses US or Canadian wood packaging material. And anywhere else in the world, you have to procure treated wood to get make sure your shipment gets across. How do we ship to trade shows? We know trade shows are um, an important vehicle, an important means to meet potential customers, to display our products. Uh, even though since March, we haven't had the opportunity to exhibit or to visit trade shows. As you know, I don't have to remind you of that. You're all aware of that. Um, I think we have, to, uh, we have to be confident that this will come back that we will overcome this and that we will be able to visit trade shows and exhibit at trade shows at some point in the future. So all I wanted to highlight here with these couple of slides were, was the fact that when you ship goods to trade shows, you have to be aware of, of the customs requirement. You have to, and sometimes companies don't, uh, don't realize that, don't prepare well for that. And sometimes, they, they, they invest money in, in exhibiting at a trade show and, they're, they're, and then their displays are stuck at the airport or at the port or at the border. Uh, so the principles here when you ship goods to trade shows is that if you, you have to issue, if you're shipping, there's two categories of products that you're going to ship to trade shows. There's the giveaways, the things you will distribute free of charge. It'll be your perhaps brochures, printed matter, uh, it will be samples, it will be giveaways, uh, t-shirts or hats with the uh, logo of your company or pens. And uh, so these will be cleared customs uh, as uh, definitive imports, i.e. as good that will stay there. And so if you ship these kinds of samples and giveaways um, along with um, display material and uh, a, a booth, for example, that is going to then be shipped back to Canada afterwards. So you have to issue two separate pro forma invoices, one for the giveaways that will stay there in the country of uh, uh, exhibition, and one separate one for the goods that will be going there temporarily and come back. Uh, because we need, to do, we need to do two customs operations for this, two, two types of, um, of goods, of, uh, of shipment. So, um, that brings me to temporary entry in the U.S. So this is a bit uh, drilling into the customs nitty-gritty. Uh, this, for your information, uh, when we are able to go back to trade shows, the U.S., of course, is our favorite destination. There's so many trade shows from east to west to north to south that we can go to. So just be aware that there's a specific customs process that we have to follow. It's called the TIB, where we ship displays to a, to a fair. Um, our uh, convention and we'll be displaying that and then returning them to Canada afterwards. So we have to be aware that there's specific customs clearances that have to be done. Uh, so the main tool that we use is called the TIB, Temporary Import on the Bond. We have to make sure that um, when we ship the goods back to Canada, for example, that the TIB is cleared, is canceled. Otherwise it stays open and then the US will think that you left the goods in the US. We wouldn't want that to happen because the next time you, you go, then they might grab you. Uh, so that's just to describe um, very simply here that, that process. And there's another way, another tool that can be used in the US and in um, 84 other countries is called an ATA Carnet. And so that is very convenient if you're shipping goods to exhibitions or trade shows. And if you're going to go to several trade shows as part of the same voyage, because you can use a carnet, you use the carnet once, and then you can use it in all these countries. So it's another tool that we use that is very powerful if you go to different countries, uh, as well as uh, if you go to the US, um, 
several times. If you go many times during the year, it's uh, more efficient to use to issue one carnet and then because you can use it several times within the year. So companies that go to a trade show once or twice a year in the US or three times, it's, it's fine to use the TIB. But if you go more often than that, then you might be better off having an ATA carnet issued. It will enable you to travel back and forth as many times as you want with your displays, with your exhibits. Uh, for a year with the same um, document, document the same uh, tool. And so, uh, believe it or not, I'm, I'm getting to the end of the presentation. I hope that you're still with me. Um, I wanted to highlight the fact that, uh, the, um, that we are in, in a unique position, having these trade agreements with these three huge trading zones, the uh, Kuzma with the US and Mexico, CETA with the European Union, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that Evan was mentioning earlier with Pacific countries. The full name is CPTPP. I abbreviated with TPP. Uh, sorry about that. But you know, in closing, what I wanted to show you is that it's great to have these tools, you know, uh, because they make our products more competitive and uh, because our products don't pay 0% duties in these countries, which gives us an advantage over other countries. But you know, these tools are great, but they're great so long as we use them. And I wanted to end with this, to, to share this information with you. This uh, just came out um, from Global Affairs two weeks ago. Global Affairs have done a study, a survey of the utilization rate of free trade agreements by Canadian companies. And so I found that quite amazing, uh, very surprising, in fact, that uh, when it comes, I, and I'm not sure what the figures are with the TPP, but with the, with the CETA agreement with the European Union, would you believe that overall, only 50% of Canadian companies that deal with, the, with Europe take advantage of the um, free trade agreement uh, tariff reduction feature? So I found that quite, uh, quite surprising. Uh, it shows that uh, we have we still have a lot of work to do to uh, to uh, to um, uh, let everyone know that we have these trade agreements. Also, to be familiar with how to use these features and how to master. We talked about rules of origin last week, so these are important things to um, to become familiar with, and um, also uh, part, you know important tools. Uh, that are uh, are going to help us uh, expand and grow our business, but uh, only if we use them. Uh, and it's, it's a real shame that we um, that we only use uh, that only half of companies actually use the features of this trade agreement, uh, because in the in the end analysis, what it means is that we're leaving money on the table. You know, we're not taking full advantage of the tariff reduction, which. Uh, First of all, which means that we, we're leaving money on the table. We're 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 paying for for duties, whereas we shouldn't. And also, we're not exploiting the full potential of these markets. Um, so, um, I, as, as as I said a moment ago, I was really surprised to see to see these these percentages, and I wanted to share them with you because I think it's really important to um, to to be aware of these uh, of, of these. Um, uh, tools that we have and, and analyze why we're not using them and so that we hopefully use them more in the future because I think it's very much part of our of our um, success overseas is using these free trade agreements to the fullest possible. Um, so this brings me to the end of today's presentation. Um, I hope it was interesting and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and um, I'll be happy to exchange with you and answer any questions that you may have. Um, and I'll pass, so I'll hand over the microphone to Evan for the next phase of the webinar, which is our Q and A. So thank you again for your attention. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Web, um, Christian, for that uh, fantastic webinar and presentation. Um, just got one more slide here to share um, before we get into the Q and A. All right, so I guess uh, this will give you a little bit of time to think of any more questions you guys have. 
But uh, I just wanted to highlight um, some additional webinars we have coming up over the next few weeks here. Um, again, they'll be on uh, Eventbrite as well, just like this one was. So if you want to register, by all means do it. Um, pass it along to any uh, businesses you know as well that are interested in, in these areas. Um, or if you'd like me to send you the information, I, I absolutely can. So we, let's go ahead and dive into questions. Um, we've got quite a few here that uh, came in during the presentation, Christian. I'm just gonna turn off my video. All right, great. I like that. So I'll try to organize them. Uh, Absolutely. In a, in a manner that makes sense. Um, so if companies are working with a freight forwarder and or customs broker, will they be doing all the necessary paperwork needed so I don't need this headache? Uh, I would say, in theory, yes, that's what they're there for. Um, however, and, and that's why we use them for, and that's why they're very useful. Uh, however, we have to keep in mind that whatever they do, they do it on our behalf, in our name, and they are using our exporter number. Uh, so when it comes to customs compliance, uh, when it comes to fines, penalties, if something is not done right, it's the exporter who gets the fine and the penalty from uh, CBSA. It's not the freight forwarder. And uh, so all this to say that, yes, it's great to rely on, 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 uh, on these partners and they are very much part of our success. But I think we should take the step of informing ourselves well enough of the various, uh, our, of the responsibilities of the exporter and, uh, uh, and be really conscious of of, uh, uh, of all that and, and not just blindly rely on a third party. Uh, and I think also the more information you have, the more tools you have, uh, the better you'll be able to select your freight forwarder and make sure that he or she does uh, work uh, properly and, and uh, looks after your interests. So yes, rely on them, but... Uh, um, be inform yourself enough so you can make a uh, good judgment and so that you know what your responsibilities are and what your risks are. Okay. So this question kind of uh, ties into the previous one, but does the freight forwarder shoulder any risk uh, or do INCO terms ensure that the risk falls only on the importer exporter? Never. Never. Okay. I mean, the freight forwarder, let, uh, you see, uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm doing this on purpose to, to um, you know, to, um, to um, highlight the point. But uh, don't forget that the INCO term is um, something that comes in at, a, at the initial stage between the seller and the buyer. And uh, so the, um, the inco term is selected, is negotiated, is selected, and then you contact a freight forwarder. So the freight forwarder gets involved at a later stage. Uh, the freight forwarder gets involved when the inco term has already been selected. So he's not really able to play any part in selecting the inco term. Once he gets to arrange a shipment, the inco term has already been uh, selected by the parties. Where he can play a role is... Um, make you aware of the risks are of the inco term that you have that you're using for example so yes he can and uh, this is how i think you would be able to judge um, a good freight forwarder is don't judge a good freight forwarder by the cheapest price judge a freight forwarder by the kind of advice he will give you the kind of uh, information he will give you um, if a freight forwarder calls you and tells you hey you, do you realize that the inco term that you have on on your on for this shipment gives you this and that risk? Um, so that's the kind of freight forwarder I want to have, the one who will help me, coach me, who will team up with me and uh, uh, give me advice, and uh, not necessarily the one who can who is going to be the cheapest. Exactly. Yeah, I think and I think the CIFFA website that you mentioned uh, is probably is likely a good source. It has a lot of in, uh, incredible amount of information on, on all kinds of regulations. And uh, it's not just a list of freight forwarders, but also all kinds of practical information. Absolutely. Right. And another freight forwarder question. Um, so all right. would a freight forwarder 
uh, advise on incorrect INCO terms. For example, if a term is used where there is no shipment by port. Yes, you should be able to. Yes, you should be able to, to, to guide you, to advise you, to, 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 uh, to, to, to warn you and to tell you, hey, this is not the right INCO term. Based on what you're describing, the INCO term should be this or the other way around. You're using this INCO term, but you know, it gives you, uh, did you do you realize that you have these costs? Um, and so if you don't want these costs, then you should renegotiate and use that INCO term instead. So yes, they should be able to. This is, I think it would be very much part of the, it should be very much part of their function. Mm -hmm. Whether they actually do it today or not is, is a different story. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of entities, a lot of companies, a lot of, um, are getting bigger and bigger. And so, um, I, I don't know if they're all, if they're all able to give that kind of personalized service or not. Um, some may and some may not. Some may be focused on, you know, the cheapest, absolute cheapest price and um, a good tracking and tracing and might lose the um, personal touch and, and the uh, personal guidance and uh, personalized service to clients, such as what you just described. So I think that the two, both categories exist. Um, okay, so you mentioned inadequate packaging it is a main cause of cargo claims. As a new exporter, who would be able to assist me to ensure my packaging holds up for the journey abroad? Well, I guess there are standards that are applicable based on the, uh, on the product and based on the, uh, on the type of transportation. I mean, there are, there are uh, standards. I mean, a freight forwarder would be one um, that could advise you or uh, also packaging companies or companies that um, make packaging or um, so it really depends on the kind of industry you are. Um, there's all kinds of resources available actually um, for that. I would say just like, yeah, the freight forwarder or, or industry associations or you know, packaging companies, also the companies that sell these kinds of uh, packaging material. There's also uh, um, industry associations um, that can give you good information. Okay, um, another question here on freight forwarders. Uh, if I have LCL, uh, which is less than container load, Yep. Uh, will freight forwarders try to consolidate shipments and help me re reduce my price? Uh, yes, it's the essence of their business is to try to consolidate shipments and uh, indeed and offer, you know, offer um, um, consolidated services to shippers. Uh, yes, I mean, many freight forwarders do that. Uh, they provide consolidated services whereby they can... Uh, they can say with relative certainty, okay, we'll have a, we'll have a, a, a sailing or a departure every week or every two weeks and we'll, we'll handle the smallest shipments that you have and uh, we'll still only charge you based on the size and weight of your shipment. So for, yes, freight forwarders are very much, it's very much the core, uh, the core of their activities is to, uh, to handle LCL cargoes. Um, and some, some of these freight forwarders actually are a bit special as could be specialized also may have a geographic specialization, you know, like some freight forwarders might have good LCL services to Europe, but, but not to Asia and vice versa. So they may each have their specialties. Okay. Um, another question here. Um, if I am only sending product samples, so not for sale. I think you, mm -hmm. you went over this one, but is all all paperwork needed, or really just those um, the two different pro forma invoices? Yeah, if you're shipping samples, I mean, usually yes, you use a pro forma invoice, and that usually is sufficient. But it depends on the country, it depends on the type of product it is. You know, is it food? Is it foodstuffs, for example, or is it? Uh, 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 it you may need to send a, a health certificate. Um, and also depending on the country involved, the country, the destination country might have specific requirements. Uh, so it's something that we have to, to, to check based on the product and based on the destination country. But generally speaking, yes, you, 
for small shipments of low value samples that are not sold, is generally accepted that uh, all we need to do is a pro forma invoice, but we, we should still be careful depending on where we're shipping the goods to. Absolutely. Um, all right, another question. Um, so it was really a day for freight forwarders today. That's great. Freight, freight forward heavy. <laughs> who do I call? Excellent. Who do I call if my goods are stuck at the border? Well, the people who will help you will be a customs broker. Uh, a freight forwarder, customs broker. Um, yes, we'll be able to untangle that because they know what the requirements are. They also have, way, uh, they also have direct communication channels with customs uh, and they can identify what the problem is and can help you uh, correct it either by presenting the right documentation or the right data or the right uh, um, information. Um, it's really customs brokers, freight forwarders, that's, that's, their, uh, that's their bread and butter. That's their day-to-day -day activity. And uh, as I said, they have the knowledge, the know-how, and also the, the lines of communication. You know, sometimes, I mean, how do we do, do, do you want to call customs today? Who are you going to call? You know, you, <laughs> it's very hard to get a hold of anybody nowadays, right? Especially with COVID-19, right? Uh, but the brokers, the freight forwarders, they do this on a, on a continuous basis. So if you call a freight forwarder, customs broker, and say, hey, my, my shipment is stuck at this port or that airport or that border crossing point, I'm not sure what the problem is. They can probably find out relatively easily what the problem is and then get back to you and find a, uh, find a, find a solution with you or help you find a solution. Uh, you could also call customs directly, but it's quite hard to get a hold of these people right. and get an answer sometimes. Uh, sounds tricky. All right. So another question here on freight forwarders. Uh, would you advise working with smaller, more local freight forwarders or the larger well-known companies? Uh, well, there's pros and cons for both. I think it depends um, also on the type of, of business you do. Uh, the large uh, freight forwarders will tend to be uh, highly competitive and will tend to be organized um, to offer a worldwide, a kind of a seamless worldwide service. And so they, 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 cater, they cater basically to multinational companies that want to have a seamless, you know, a partner who can handle their global requirements. I mean, the big ones, this is their, this is how they are successful is because they have a, they have a huge presence, a huge network, so they can offer services everywhere. And so they're, they're key players. They're very valuable for, you know, for Procter and Gamble and, and Kraft or, or, or these kinds of companies that have, you know, worldwide supply chains. Um, if you're a small company, if you're an SME, they might not really be geared to, to, to handling your freight. And you may prefer a local small, small freight forwarder who will have perhaps a more personalized approach and um, will be in a better position to, to guide you and to help you and work with you. I think it's, a, it's one of the difficulties when you begin, when you begin by, by definition, you're small. So if, you, if you're small, when you call the big guys, I mean, they won't even listen to you because you're too small, because they, they want to deal with big clients only. Um, so I think probably when you begin a, a local freight forwarder who is serious, experienced, and has good agents uh, will be uh, as good for you, if not better than the large multinational. Right. Uh case by case basis, maybe what the company is comfortable working with. And it might also depend on the type of product. For example, if you're shipping goods that are um, not, that have no special requirement, you know, if you're shipping commodities um, that have no particular requirements or no, 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 no unusual requirements, that's one thing. If you're shipping uh, perishable goods, 
uh, then that's that's a different story. Then then you really want to deal with someone who will give you personalized service and will pay close pay close attention to the requirements. So it also depends in that sense on the nature of the cargo. Does your cargo does your product require a bit more attention than than a generic product would? Then a smaller freight forwarder might be your best bet. Yes. All right. So last question here um, in the chat. Um, no more questions on freight forwarders, Evan? Not, nothing yet. I'll see if one pops. <laughs> at the end of it. This one is not about freight forwarding. Yes. Is that the one from Shamim? Yes. You saw that one, right? Okay. Yeah. I see it on the chat here. Actually, I, I, I've been looking at it. So I, I can read it if you want. Or Yeah. Uh, sure. Shamim is asking if there's a concern that there is a layering of route involving dealer or sub-dealer company manufacturers and or perhaps that the goods are stolen goods. How would the buyer be protected? Or well, indeed, yes, Shamim, indeed, that, ex that, that, that exists. And that is, um, that is a problem sometimes with um, international trade is that the product that you're buying uh, may have changed hands several times. So it's really hard to protect yourself against that but, uh, or against any potential issues with that. I think the the main thing would be to to get as much information from the seller of the product and try to check him or her out and uh, uh, to be able to make a judgment, you know, whether the goods are legitimate or whether there's any problem with the goods. So I think it's really that is to try to gauge, find, get get information on who the seller is, and. Um, to try to evaluate any potential risk like this, because for some products it's common to, you know, a cargo of grain or a cargo of oil uh, or a cargo of um, uh, iron ore will change hands several times. It's bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold. Uh, and then, although this only this happens with specific commodities, it can also happen with any kind of product. and. Uh, how to protect yourself on the legitimacy is really to know the party that you're dealing with or try to know the party as uh, that you're dealing with as much as possible. Get proper documentation for it also for the goods. In some cases, you know what some people do here, you talk about more about importing, but there is, uh, if you're more on the importing side is uh, have the cargo inspected by an independent surveyor, um, wherever the cargo might be. So I hope that answers your question, Shamim. Yeah, I, th I, th I hope so. Uh, it's a common issue. Sorry to interrupt you, Ivan. It just reminded me of something. It's a common issue. You know, we buy a lot of goods from China. China is a manufacturing center for the world. And it sometimes it's very difficult uh, for, for, for Canadian manufacturers or distributors uh, who, who source products in China, it's actually very difficult to find out who the actual manufacturer is. It's because there's so many intermediaries. And it is a problem sometimes, indeed, yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks, Christian. I think that answered it to, to some extent. So I'll see if uh, Shamim wants further information. We can maybe reach out via email. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Evan, but yes, if anybody else has any questions that come to mind, you know, after the presentation, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Evan, uh, to reach out to me directly or, or reach out to Evan and uh, we'll always uh, be uh, very happy to answer any questions you may have, any questions that come to mind after the, uh, the end of today's webinar. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So we're we're right on time here. So it's a great, great, uh, great time to wrap it up. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for uh, taking the time out of your day to to sit in on this webinar. And uh, thank you so much, Christian, uh, for the, all the information. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Absolutely. So I hope you guys found a lot of value out of it. Again, it'll it will be sent out uh, in the next coming days. The recording. Um, so yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and uh, take care. Bye for now. Thank you all. Bye for now.